Okay, thank you. So I think as a segue to Dr. Curran's talk, I'm gonna now move a little bit high with the age towards uh, pediatric, and I think there's gonna be several similarities between our talks. I have no financial disclosure relevant to this uh, presentation. So clinical trials are primarily geared towards drug efficacy. This is what drives those studies. Uh, there are much less, um, much less uh, valid when we talk about drug safety. There are multiple reasons for that in terms of sample size calculation and drug design. This is another reason what you see here are typical participants of a phase one uh, clinical trial. You'll see healthy young male, um, and those are the patients or participants who take those medication. Even in phase three trials, those are very monitored and customized um, uh, conditions where the patient gets the drug. But this is the reality. These are the patients who actually receive the drug at the end of the day. Um, and because they don't look like the ones before, this is where uh, issues start to surface. We know for many years that children have been disadvantaged in terms of medications for multiple reasons. Historically, they've been deprived and actually excluded from clinical trials. This has changed over the last uh, two decades, but uh, we definitely have much less data on the safety and efficacy, and we have way, uh, way less uh, drug labels. We have less formulations that are pediatric friendly, and for that reason, we use compounding and other methods that are less than optimal when we uh, provide medications to children. And we look at the hospital setting, especially the more acute ones, ICU, NICU, and emergency departments, up to 80% of medications we give the children have never been indicated either for this age group or the indication. And I'll give you a few examples that I do daily. If I give a Tylenol for a six-week-old baby with fever, that has never been indicated. This is a young child uh, who's getting an adrenaline mask for croup or stridor. This is all off-label drug use. So definitely kids are uh, in a dis huge disadvantage in that aspect. There are several regulatory bodies. I just highlighted a few and, and other monitoring system that um, try to address that issue basically through a phase four post-marketing uh, surveillance trying to identify uh, side effects to children. I'm going to give you a couple examples because I don't think it's a one thing. So this is a baby, I don't know if it projects that well, baby with or newborn with uh, anotia, a very severe and uncommon malformation of the ear. Um, and this is the original paper from 35 years ago in New England that presented those cases, 21 newborns of mothers who've been treated with retinoic acid for acne and they caused this very unique malformation. So you needed a very small group of children to show an extremely uncommon malformation and the correlation association was easily, was easily shown. But I don't think it's always the case. Here is a completely different example to my opinion. This is an FDA warning from 2013 talking about the risk of Stephen Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis life-threatening conditions in patients who receive Tylenol or acetaminophen. This is how those patients look like. It's a systemic condition uh, with up to 50% mortality in adults, a little bit less in, in kids, but a very, very severe condition. Most of those patients are in ICU. They need skin grafts, et cetera. And it's also very rare, about six to eight people out of a million population over a year. And if you think of that, many of those people in the million population will take Tylenol. And many times for fever and infectious conditions that may be related to, this, to these conditions. Therefore, the association 
uh, is not that strong and actually doubt whether uh, there's a causal factor there. So those extreme conditions is exactly the space where uh, we were interested in this drug. Ondansetron is a strong uh, uh, serotonin antagonist on the 5 uh, 3 receptor. It was first approved by the FDA in 1991 uh, for nausea and vomiting in patients uh, who received cancer chemotherapy. Over the years, we've started to use this medication in the emergency department for many, many other indications, and most commonly for this indication. This is, a, this is an infant with a viral condition, acute uh, gastroenteritis, a very common viral infection of the gastrointestinal tract. And as you can see, the child is lethargic, sunken eyes, and they can become very sick. Actually, it's one of the leading causes of death in young children in the developing world. And if you look at the US, more than 50 million documented episodes every year and almost two million emergency department visits. Treatment for this condition is supportive with fluids and commonly with antiemetics, just like this uh, on Dancentron that I showed. In 2011, the FDA uh, issued a warning that suggests that on Dancentron can induce fatal arrhythmias. It also recommended that any patient with the potential to have a, a condition called a congenital long QT syndrome uh, should be tested before getting this drug, and every such patient should have an ECG done and serum electrolyte, electrolytes done before you give them this medication. This is congenital long QT syndrome. It, it has a very distinct and sign on the ECG, a prolongation of the QT interval that you can see on the right. And it's a very, very uncommon condition, as I mentioned, about one in 15 or 16,000 in the population. And in most patients, it's an asymptomatic condition and until something happens and they go into arrhythmia, but there's no other signs that uh, would suggest those patients are um, at risk. Um, and therefore, it's, it's, it's an asymptomatic condition, and we typically don't know about those patients. So when this uh, warning came out of the ADA, it caused a huge issue in almost every emergency department. I'll give you an example. At, at, uh, at Toronto, in, at SickKid, we see over 70,000 kids a year, many of them for acute gastroenteritis, and if we needed to uh, do an ECG, an electrolyte on every child, it would dramatically impact the patient flow. Um, so while we don't know what would be the, the uh, benefit of adhering to those uh, guidelines, it would absolutely cause a lot of issues. Again, in course patient flow, there are studies from Boston showing that to identify one true case of congenital long QT uh, T syndrome, you're going to misidentify, have false, 2,000 false positives. Just to find that one simple case, uh, one true case, if you do it as a blanket universal uh, recommendation with cost of close to $10 million to identify that single case. So a lot of anxiety, a lot of unnecessary testing, those who treat kids know that many of those times, you don't know how to read the ECG, they're very tachycardic, the serum electrolytes come hemolytic, you have to repeat that. It dramatically affects the, the flow of the entire ED and the ability to provide care to even other patients. So in order to address that, uh, my team decided to look at the literature and look looked at the evidence that brought up this uh, recommendation, and we went to the FDA, the, the FEAR system. It was quite challenging to get the data, I had to go through the Freedom of Information Act. We got the information from the WHO Vigibase uh, system, from the manufacturer of the drug GSK, and we did a full systematic review of the literature and gray literature, absorbs anything that we could find at the time. 
What we were trying to see is any report of an occurrence of an arrhythmia within 24 hours of administration of ondansetron. The primary uh, objective was to really focus on a single oral dose, which is what we give in the emergency department. We typically give an oral dissolving tablet that we can give even to infants, a single dose. After that, they can usually drink and keep the fluids down, and then we can send them home. And we also looked at any arrhythmia at following any dose and any route of administration. Here are the results. Looking at all the evidence that was uh, available at the time, there was not even a single report of a child or an adult who were otherwise healthy, received a single oral dose, and developed arrhythmia. When we looked deeper, the FDA had 12 such uh, cases and a total of 60 when we looked at all the other databases in the literature. But basically, all of them involved either IV, high dose, um, or corona, uh, chronic administration. And almost all patients had other significant conditions like sepsis, or they were on three or four other long queue pro uh, prolonging medications, which could explain the, um, the issue. And basically, not even a single case for our primary outcome. Since then, there was booming in the literature. Many groups repeated our study in different scenarios. And uh, this is a study uh, who looked at 200,000 doses in Wisconsin. They had seven uh, uh, cases of arrhythmias, all of them in patients who had severe major uh, cardiac malformations. This is another study looking at a IV, low IV dose. Again, not even a single case, not even QT prolongation in any method they looked at. <coughs> Here is another study that was done prospectively in a pediatric emergency department. Hundreds of children had an ECG before and after on Dancentron. Again, not even a single case of even QT prolongation, let alone arrhythmia. So when you summarize this data, we're talking now almost on 20, on, on 30 years of experience with the drug with more than 300 million uh, treatment days. We feel that there's not enough evidence to support a universal screening um, because of the many reasons I mentioned on cost and flow and, and side effects. We should probably re-stratify those patients. So, in our emergency department now, we do do ECGs and electrolytes on kids who have cardiac issues, who are getting IV doses, but we never uh, do that on patients who are otherwise healthy. And this helps us, uh, I believe, improve uh, clinical care. And I think this has been now replicated in many other studies and many other emergency departments. And I'd like to thank you with that. Yeah,